Have you been scrolling through many, many, many film podcasts thinking there's far too many of these? Or have you been thinking there's something missing? There's something we're not quite getting. A waffler from Northern England reviewing films, for example. Welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. No politics, no pandering, no point. Welcome everyone, welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. Uh, I'm going to be sniffing, she's going to be coughing. <laughs> Stay tuned, people. Uh, <laughs> Maybe one of so, us will barf by the end just to make it a little more interesting. Yeah. Or, or puke, vomit. I, no, I did enough of that last week. There's been a bug going oh, on. So. Yeah. No. Both ends, man. Terrible. Anyway. Uh, well, welcome, people. Welcome, people. <laughs> uh, if you haven't already tuned out. Yeah. Tends to happen on mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my guest today is Alexia from Titanic Talk Pine. Hello. Um, Ahoy. We're doing, we're doing Ghosts of the Abyss, the 2003 yes. documentary by James Cameron. That's right, isn't it? Yes. I hope so. I've read the book. What am I asking myself? Um, <laughs> I know so it yes. came out sometime before 2005 and after 2000, so that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. It was filmed in 2001. Oh, we'll get into the tech. We'll get into the actual facts. Because as you know, if there's one thing about doing any kind of Titanic stuff, oh, someone will correct you. If you get someone's name wrong, or if you get like, that wasn't on B deck, it was on C deck, and you go, oh, well, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you can watch um, people have full existential crises over tiny little fact changes. It's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's nice to see that kind of passion, but I mean, we're, we're human beings. Like, I've I've read the book, well, mm-hmm. like skim read it. Um, I haven't read it, notes. so you're ahead of me on that. <laughs> it's interesting because I have some fun facts to throw in there whilst nice. we're talking about the actual um, the actual documentary. So I'm thinking we'll go through the documentary. And then we'll go through, like, I can go through a bit more on the dives because I've read the book and stuff. Um, yeah, I might say I've read the book. It's only because I'm, like, trying to give myself a nice pat on the back for being like, you you prepared, you researched for once. That's part of the reason I do a film podcast. I don't have to do any yeah. research. I just yeah, get to watch great. a film and go, yeah, it's all right. Or, exactly. It's not. <laughs> There's not a whole lot you need to really do and it's just about a movie. It's like the whole point is I get to watch the movie. I took a class in college specifically on film based on books because i was like oh i get to watch the movies <laughs> a plus i'm in i created uh, um we had to do this like for a couple of hours a week in college which is like between secondary school and university so n- different to your college mm-hmm. but anyway so we had to do this kind of enrichment in the afternoon and i created like a film review club and mm-hmm. we watched films in the basically in the classroom uh, until we got stopped about two months in because they said <laughs> we don't have the copyright to do this because, you know, when oh. you put a film on it, it says, like, cannot be shown in schools, prisons, wherever. You're not allowed to kind of do it. So they were gonna, oh. they could have, like, got in trouble. So they said, no, you can't do it. So that was oh, a bit that's... that was a bit disappointing. But, that I mean, that's, disappointing. that's what I'll do to get out of doing work. Um, <laughs> so, Usually yeah. Works. Yeah, it worked quite well, to be fair, um, for a couple of months. So for anyone who doesn't know, I've, I've muted myself. What am I doing? Right, I'm talking. <laughs> Oh my lord! <laughs> right, <laughs> that's my own fault. Right. Um. So w- the. <laughs> oh my god! This is what happens when I'm. I've got a cold and I'm too hot. Right. So. <sighs> god, God help me all. Right. It's uh, the so film... the documentary. Yeah. Thank it, you. It, it, take it, it, take it, it, it. Okay. Let me see. Oh uh, yeah. Take a sip of tea. So it's um. It was done in two. As you said, it was it was released in two thousand and three, but as you said, they started filming it. Pro- you know, two thousand two thousand and one, and it was. I can't tell if it was you know just James Cameron's excuse to go back to Titanic or what, but he does go back to Titanic on the Keldish, and he brings with him um, beloved and lost treasure Bill Paxton, and Lewis Abernathy, who played shockingly lewis in the 1997 film titanic and they they go back to titanic they look at some um comparative footage they kind of rethink the film a little bit and they do what is my favorite part of it which is where they assemble and lower the lifeboat i don't know why but i really i like that yeah it's it's um it's it's a really interesting documentary um so basically as as you were saying alexia that uh, the main players in it are Bill Paxton, uh, you've got James Cameron, Ken Marshall is the visual historian, Don Lynch uh, for the Titanic mm-hmm. Historical Society, and anyone who knows, you know, he's kind of like the go-to guy on 
the passengers and the crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've they, got Louis um, Abernathy. Yeah, they were Sorry. also very involved with the original, um, with the making of the film itself. And even before that, they were the two big names that wrote what some people affectionately refer to as the Bible, which is the, an, a very large illustrated book about Titanic. So for a long time, it was one of the main authorities. So they've been you know, big names in the community for a long time. So having them involved was... Um, pretty remarkable and some shots that are in the movie itself are directly based off of Ken Marshall's paintings which I think is really cool a little a little nod to to the artist who came and dedicated his time oh yeah there's a lot of names that sorry it's all right I was just gonna say there's a lot of names that like if you're familiar with the movie or the Titanic community you'll 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 recognize them as they come on you're like even if you don't know their names you're like oh it's that guy yeah definitely because obviously the Keldish is the ship that's in the actual Titanic movie um And also, I mean, there was even more throwbacks to Ken Marshall's actual uh, paintings because when you watch the Titanic film, um, there's a, there's a woman who walks down the staircase in a red dress, and that mm-hmm. was a direct um, like they took it straight from from that book, um, the visual history, because there's a lady walking down the uh, down the stairs with a red dress on, and she actually the lady who wore that dress actually saw them and said, "Oh, did you do this on purpose?" So like Cameron was like, "Of course I did." Um, <laughs> so yeah, this. As you were saying, there's Lewis Abernathy, who they wrote the 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 role of Lewis in Titanic for him. He's mm-hmm. like, um, he helps them. He's like an underwater explorer in terms of where to go. There's Anatoly Sagalevich and uh, Genya Cherniev. They're like the Russian pilots. Mm-hmm. Now you talk about this being kind of was it Cameron's excuse to go back? Well, this was a real family affair because it doesn't really show it in the in the documentary film as such, but in the book we've got Mike Cameron, who's James Cameron's brother, brother with a team of. Uh, of people took three years to design and build those little ro- robots. And also, we've got Jim Cameron's other brother, or James Cameron's other brother, uh, John David, who actually oversaw a live internet broadcast of mm-hmm. the documentary under the name Earthship.tv. And not only that, you've also got um, Russian um, videographer Sergei Kudryashov was creating documentaries for Russian television. So there's a lot going on. Yeah, and I'll, as you said, being like a family affair with a lot of the original players coming coming back in to be be involved with this project again, which was which is pretty cool to see, especially because um, I do like that they brought in somebody like Bill Paxton, who is a familiar name and everything, and you can kind of follow along with his journey because he's you know like most people watching is not a deep sea diver, like he's not a marine biologist. His job is not diving down to like three miles under the ocean so being able to follow him and actually watch him be shocked and awed and talk about the process was um i think a really good way to go about filming the documentary because many of these documentaries especially um things about like titanic or anything to do with maritime history they can kind of feel a little bit removed and cold because you just jump right in with these people who know so much and it's like, well, I don't know a damn thing about anything that you're talking about. So I was like, I can't follow along from the beginning. But I can follow along with Bill Paxton being like, not speaking the language on a boat, asking directions on a boat, not getting the directions on a boat and being like, well, guess I got to find out where on this boat I'm going. Pretty <laughs> much. I don't speak Greek. <laughs> I think it's Russian. Russian, I think they are, aren't they? I don't remember. Yeah, uh, the Russian. worker, he specifically, yeah. Russian. Yeah, oh, he was still Russian, just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, either the, way, it's just kind of like that's very relatable. I wouldn't be able to yeah. figure that out either. Yeah, I know one. I know one thing in Russian, and it would not help me. Um, um, привет. It's uh, well, спасибо, which is please, and I know a uh, what's the other one? Lavas Lublu, which is I love you, which doesn't help you do anything. It might be might be the <laughs> nah, wrong impression to give getting on the boat. <laughs> just okay. a tiny little bit. I think I think I can go with hello, and that's as far as we get. Everybody, so just walk around like an NPC. <laughs> Um, so yes, we've also got um, Lev, who was like a Russian cowboy. Uh, well, that's what they call them, cowboys, the rope handlers. So he's the guy who we see jumping off like the little raft, the little like mm-hmm. boat onto, and he un- uncouples the cable that holds the mirror to the crane on the Kel- Keldish. So the Keldish, the Russian research vessel, has two deep sea submersibles, the mirror one and two, uh, the mm-hmm. four hundred foot uh, long, which is, I mean just under half the length of the Titanic, to put it in perspective, is one of the few vessels yeah. in the world that can actually, is equipped to handle a dive to Titanic. I mean, it's two and a half miles down, the mm-hmm. bone crushing pressure, you know. But I, I will say this as well for, for this documentary, it shows you how difficult it is to dive, how dangerous yes. it is to do. Because I think a lot of Titanic documentaries <clears> that you watch, because <throat> I've seen loads about exploring the ship, they just go straight into exploring it. It's like they're there. Mm-hmm. They don't go through all the 
preparations and this is what we need to do and get your will stuff sorted and take your fiber tablets so you don't need the toilet and all that kind of stuff no all of it and i uh, you're right because you, even in you know fictional portrayals like the movie itself is very abbreviated because you kind of have to get to the point and that's sort of the whole thing but i think that the point of this documentary was how it happened so showing that you know yeah you don't just like get to the surface and immediately hop out of the mirror some guy his entire job is to hop off of a ship come and retrieve you and make sure you're okay and he could die in that process that's his whole job though and you don't see that in the movie really i mean you kind of do there's like one shot of a guy sitting astride the mirror but it, it doesn't indicate exactly who he is it doesn't indicate oh shit before i get on this vessel i have to sign my life affairs in order because it might get wild down here pretty much i mean and i think it, it's interesting to see like bill paxton the juxtaposition between brock lovett being very kind of well all this bullshit about two and a half miles down where she fell after a long fall from the world above talking to, like an old school like a modern yeah, yeah. day tiktoker into yeah, yeah. this freaking camcorder just like, you sound like a tosser mate just move on with it <laughs> whereas in, in you know in real in the in reality he's there going and i love that scene where he's just like that oxygen what what's that supposed to read yeah, okay well, uh, no but what's it supposed to read oh it, it, the russian guy's like it's okay it's okay, it's okay. no no it's okay. what's it what's it supposed to read <laughs> they, like they do this all you know they're experts i mean yeah, exactly yeah, you know they know like the best of the best and you've got him there kind of going yeah but like is that okay it, it's it's fine like you can tell the guy's like i'm busy here can you just right. stop <laughs> definitely yeah, but it's that normal person inclination to panic because normally things like that don't occur to you. Then all of a sudden you're a mile below the surface of the water and you're like, I don't, hey, normally my oxygen percentage is like 80, but that meter is saying like 40. Is that normal for this breath or am I just freaking out? And if someone would just kind of like, it's fine all the time, I'd be like, no, 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 I hear you, but I need a little more info on that. Like, I, I'm not trying to be a Karen, but I need you to 411 that just a little bit. Yeah, just, just please... Just please, I just need a bit of reassurance. Just, just a, bit of a reassurance tiny, a, an explanation to be like, it's fine when you get to this pressure, science reason here. And then I'd be like, okay, cool. And then I won't bother you again. But if you don't tell me anything, I'm going to bother you like a toddler for snacks for the next hour. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's also as well, there's the MT, uh, e uh, I spelled it wrong. There's a, a support vessel. It might be spelled wrong. The MTES, I think it's called. Uh, it's mm. a dynamic positioning ship. So, this is what holds the Medusa in place. So the Medusa is this overhead lighting rig. So basically like mm -hmm. a big chandelier, the fanciest way to put it. They lower huge. it over the ship, huge. Um, and that was like unprecedented. That had never been done before because the only the only other time the film Titanic, it was either spotlights because it exists mm -hmm. in perpetual darkness. If anybody does listen to this and doesn't know a lot about Titanic, it sits in darkness because it's obviously that far down. There's no natural light can get anywhere near it you can so even only... tell in that footage from the titanic like the real titanic footage you can tell when it's real titanic footage because it's very spotlit you can see all that um the filament floating in front of it because yeah. there's no way to sort of get that nice overhead lighting there's no overhead lighting you've got a flashlight down there and that's what you're working with two that's miles right. under it's dark as hell you have basically a flashlight and there's a bunch of stuff in your way and not just like stuff but just like particulates like it's it's not a clear go it's not a beautiful no. lake no it's it's i mean i think james cameron describes it in the book and no doubt he's talking about an american football pitch but it makes the same <laughs> same idea mm -hmm. that he says it's like exploring a football pitch with a flashlight and you're on your hands and knees mm -hmm. just crawling around trying to find something that's what it's like yeah. um like looking top. for a contact lens in a field at night yeah with a torch slash whatever exactly. you know so that's the kind of thing um so obviously we've got the two remotely operated vehicles the little bots mm -hmm. but one and two are as they're very quickly named jake and elwood because part of the film becomes about their rescue doesn't it because they both kind of break at certain points one of them gets pretty far in so they were far they were exploring farther inside of the wreck i think they were saying they were trying to go back to some places or they were trying to explore a little bit farther because now that the technology is advanced, I think that they had, you know, again, they had this massive freaking chandelier. It doesn't even cover it. it. If you encountered this chandelier on its own, you might think it's a sea monster. It's insanely huge. But, you know, they have this lighting now. There's a little, they now know a little bit more about the interior of the ship. So they were trying to do a little bit more exploring. And one of the exploring cameras 
I don't remember which one, died somewhere inside of the ship. So they're like, well, the only way to get it is to send that second one in there because you can't yeah. just like deploy a human. It's not Star Wars. You can't just send uh, somebody out there under the sea. It's it's that or nothing. And this is, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment. Yeah. And the footage is on the camera. It's not remotely beamed back. It would have been so much lost work. So they send the other one in there to get it, which is risky in and of itself. And luckily they managed to get it. They managed to hook it around. And then they have to get this ridiculous dance through of bringing it out. And it's hard enough to get things through the Titanic when you can kind of control the little sub. When you have no control over the one because it's dead and floating along behind you like a balloon, there's a whole host of other problems. But it took a while. They were somehow managed to get them out, both of them. Well, it actually, it's actually even worse than what happened than what I show you in the film. So mm, I think I think really? it's I think it's Elwood that breaks. I think so. Jake, that the, sounds the other one right, but I didn't in. want to say it and be wrong. Uh, <laughs> people are only correct. It's fine. And then and then so they get Elwood and Jake's dragging Elwood out, and then Jake mm-hmm. gets caught as well. So yep. there's this tussle, and you're seeing it that Cameron's thinking, Jesus, we've lost both of these. There's nothing we can do. When I read the book, they were stuck for that long. To, like both of them were stuck. You know when he's trying to move it forward, and he's like, we can't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. They actually. Uh, James Cameron and the pilot with him like of the submersible tried to sever the line and it failed they actually tried to cut the submersibles loose so they don't wow. show you that in the film but in the in in the actual when it happened they tried to sever because obviously they need to the submersible need needs that. to go you can't be tethered so um so it was yeah it was um it's quite you know even more kind of difficult than it was made out in the film really which I thought was quite interesting that's scary when you think, I mean, it doesn't sound like a big deal. You're like, oh, what's the big deal? Uh, the big deal is if that is stuck and you are tied to it and you run out of resources, good luck. You've got yeah. about 30 seconds. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, it, there's nothing that could be, it'd be like being on the moon. There's mm. nothing could be done for you. You're not going to get rescued. Right. <laughs> there's, there's, it's not like, oh, there could be a miracle. No, there's, there's literally there's, no there's help nothing. for you whatsoever. Yeah, um, good luck. Unless you get a really benevolent squid, you're seriously screwed. <laughs> um, good segue Maybe. though, because they have uh, they have like biologist on board as well, mm-hmm. uh, who I, I didn't write her name down. Apologies. She's great. She's there Many to people. basically look at the rusticles and look at different types of fish, and because they found different things down there they've never seen before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's like it is an alien world essentially. Really, I mean, it's yeah. that it's that alien to us. Um, but I think just to talk about how dangerous it is, um, Bill Paxton was actually, um, he was told when he was given a big briefing when he went on board. And one of the things was don't go out on the deck in rough seas without telling anybody. Because if you go overboard, nobody knows. And you know, you know, It's not like you know the normal sea where you can shout and scream, help me. You, you're just going to, you, you're gone basically. You're gone. If you survive the fall. So it's exactly rough. Um, nice uplifting episode for everybody. Keep listening. Um <laughs> <laughs> They it makes use... me think twice about those smoke breaks. Oh, absolutely. They use um, a model that they use for Titanic uh, mm-hmm. to like meticulously plan the dive and where they're going to go. But they did notice during the dive that there's a, a lot of... Um, since Because there was a, the dive in 90, 1985 when it was discovered. Then James mm-hmm. Cameron goes down in 1995 for the film. Right. And then he goes down, you know, seven years... How many years later? Six years later? Seven or ten years later, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, goes down in okay. 2001 to do the dives. Mm-hmm. And he, they see kind of like the gymnasium's collapsed. There's big, massive holes yeah. in the decks. Like there's been a lot more deterioration. Is, is that something that you noticed as well watching? So I also recently looked at footage from the Ocean Gate exploration, um, which took place this summer in 2022. So I I noticed it in Ghosts of the Abyss, but obviously between then and now, that's almost 20 years since there has been. So what we're going to do, guys, actually, what we should do, wait till it, listen to all the way of this and we'll see it at the end. There you yes, go. there we go. So I, had, I totally forgot that. I, was... <laughs> I have officially forgotten what I was saying. <laughs> um... <laughs> Couldn't have been that important. Uh, no, um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, that, so that was it. So Lewis, um, he, him, Marshall and Lynch, they mm-hmm. drafted visual navigation aids mm-hmm. to help the divers get where they need to be outside A and inside total the ship. necessity, by the way, because oh, yeah. if you look at even just like not a non-detailed floor plan of just one floor of Titanic, 
you get freaking lost in there just looking for your lunch. There is absolutely, and now that things have been deteriorating and, and stuff, the ceilings aren't there. And and that part of my concern going back to the um, retrieval mission was like, I was afraid they were going to bump something and that whole superstructure was just going to go down like a flan in a cupboard. Like, d- d- it, that thing is being held together by like spite and prayers. I don't know. I genuinely don't know what's holding that ship together because it it's fragile and collapsing. But yeah, it's well, scary. The, the rusticle <laughs> the rusticles on it because mm-hmm. for people who don't know a lot about it, um, they are basically they're biological organisms. There's more life on the Titanic now than there was when it sank. Fully enough, but. Those rusticles, are, it, it's it's crazy. Those are actual bacteria that are eating. They they eat the iron, but as they eat the iron and they get bigger, they're taking the strength out of the because they're, they're breaking down the metal. And at a certain point, the ship's just going to pancake in on itself and collapse. Uh, it's lasted a lot longer than anybody thought. I remember when I was when I first got into Titanic is like in maybe the early two thousands, and I was reading a little bit. They expected mm-hmm. it to be gone by now. They yeah, they were like saying, that. like, in it's 10 just, years, yeah. it's going to be gone. Absolutely. And obviously, oh, I looked it up, by the way. I forgot yeah, that one no of go. the species of bacteria that lives inside of the rusticles is called Halomanus titanicae. Um, right. And it's one of the many species, like you were talking about, that is literally only found there, therefore is named for it. There's new, there's new shit that we've never seen that's just yeah. coming to life down there because it is two and a half miles below the surface. And it has a bunch of wood to eat. I have no idea how all that stuff is growing down there. Yeah. But the I rusticles mean, the, yeah. are how they've been measuring some of that, um, not deterioration, but like like an icicle or like a, yeah. a stalactite or a stalagmite in a cave. You can measure the growth. Yeah. And they've been, well, I think you were going to get into it more. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. No, I've, I've remembered what you, you talked about the ocean gate before my monk distracted you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, it's 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 interesting to see because you know Ghost of the Abyss was in two thousand three, and this exploration was this summer. So that's about twenty, um, almost twenty years apart. And to see the deterioration is really I don't know, sad, the kind of word, but I mean, it's also to be expected. Like the railings are starting to fall, and the ceilings in some of the notable areas, like the um, captain's quarters, where you used to be yeah. able to see Captain Smith's bathtub, the ceiling and the um, walls are collapsing, so you can't see the tub as much just because they're now covered in stuff. So this, there is a lot of deterioration that has happened, even between you know ninety seven and two thousand three. But between two thousand three and twenty twenty two, it's been pretty shockingly, shockingly different. But the good news is, is that they brought down an 8K camera and you're able to see a lot of these rusticles yeah. and the gross on the bow of the ship in detail that we've never been able to see before because, well, we didn't have 8K under yeah. the seat. I think that, that might in some way make the deterioration look worse mm-hmm. because obviously Probably. you look at like all the other stu- the, the other footage and it's quite blurry. Well, not blurry, but it's, you know, it's like looking at old PlayStation games now. They look terrible, but at the time they look great. So I think now we like, we get in this high resolution de- of the time. Exactly. So that might make the higher definition. If you look at that, it might look even worse because you can see how That's much true. everything's deteriorated. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing to, to look at because the funny thing is about the, the rusticles and all that kind of thing is they're, the, the biologist, um, she reckons that actually the Titanic was quite well preserved for maybe for a long time. Mm-hmm. And they don't think the rusticles, they didn't start growing on it from day one that it was down there. It took a long right. time for that to happen. They reckon that it was, it might have been like 20, 30, 40. They don't know. They reckon it, the ship was down there a long time, essentially just as it was. Mm-hmm. And then it started to get broken down by the rusticles. So right. it's... I mean, obviously, I'm not a marine biologist. I haven't got a clue, but just from what I've read. Yeah, I mean, it does It does kind of make sense because like, when you think about it, it is dark and it is cold, which are the ideal conditions for preserving stuff. Um, and so for between nope, 1912 and 1985, that entire wreck was completely undisturbed by humans. So in between that time, and that's why there's like, there's no way of knowing exactly how long those rusticles have been down there, because like for that long, there was nobody down there looking at it. So it's entirely possible that it was super well preserved for a really, really, really long time until we started kind of futzing around down there and 
poking around and moving things and landing on top of the officers' quarters and damaging Uh, it and stuff like that. I don't know what's a big deal about that is. I'm like, I mean, it's the same reason they tell you not to jump on glass counters, my friend. Yeah, I mean, it's because it, yeah, and it destroys what whatever was in there that might have been expired. Now you can't do that. It's 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 gone. So exactly. But there's also there's been. It's not something that gets talked about a lot because obviously when you t- when you hear other podcasts and television programs talk about about these things to try and be as positive as you can be about the Titanic. Sure. I know it's a big tragedy, but in terms of like the documentaries and other explorers, but I know when Bob Ballard did his like return to Titanic and, and he, it, he they found out that like his plaque was stolen from like the stern, you know the plaque they left, and and so like I think that's part of the reason. I, I, really? This isn't in, this isn't in the book. The, the reasons why they did it, but when James Cameron left a plaque at the stern on on this uh, expedition in two thousand and one, they didn't put who put that down there. It was just um, mm. it was just a memorial to the people who died. It didn't have no, it's like not a novelty prize of some kind. Exactly because you know I think I think Bob Ballard had to get like a a, a new one made and they put that down there. So these these are things that don't get talked about. I mean I mean to be fair, if you want to talk but about. They- too because you need to shame people like this i don't know who you think you are where you're like this plaque has someone else's name on it i'm going to take that and i'll like just who who the fuck do you think you are yeah. like seriously where do you get the right i don't understand i feel i've never stolen anything in my life because i just like am one of those people that gets absolutely racked with guilt I, like i just don't understand like i could never see something and be like oh, like i don't know who am i thinking like i i like my favorite titanic person is officer murdoch and i could never for example find something or if i suddenly was like oh my god this was his i'm gonna keep it a secret it's mine it's like it's not though it's yeah. not mine this happened to cross my path like i'm just gonna pretend i found a pen that used to be his this is not mine it came to me by accident and I would immediately be like, oh, I gotta find somebody to give, to give this to. This isn't yeah. mine. But just like, you go down to a ship that's not yours, take a plaque that's not yours, and you're like, this is a good idea. But it is, it's, it's, uh, obviously with the plaque, they, they'd have no idea who to. I mean, there's no way to find out who that is unless you actually find the plaque and then you can. Yeah, I mean, that would have to be something that you would have to keep a secret. But I'm also one of those people that's like, not everyone. How many plaques are down there at this point in time? Do we, do we need that many? Anyway, uh, that's a I mean, there's, completely. There's quite... Different discussion. I've seen pictures where there's like, there's got to be like a good dozen because right? they all get put around the stern. Because I think, because I think, I think the point, because everyone, this is the thing with looking at the wreck, like there's nothing there. There's not a lot on the stern. Like you can't really get into yeah. it. They, they tried, yeah. they didn't really show you it in the film, but in the book, yeah, I read the book. I've mentioned about five million times. Um, that Sorry, did you, tra- you, you, you read? read uh, yeah, did you, I might. A few oh, subtle, shoot! I few didn't subtle, realize yeah, that, that was an subtle, option. A few subtle hints I threw out there. They, tr- <laughs> they tried to get it's into the you stern. you with your academics. Well, you've, you've, got, <laughs> you've got to try, haven't you? Um, <laughs> I don't. They tried, <laughs> they tried to get into the, into the stern and it just... Um, yeah. They, they couldn't. But it I think, basically collapsed and exploded. It, you know... Um, yeah, I mean, it sank full of air, so it essentially just imploded mm-hmm. and ripped itself to pieces. But I think that... The, I think the reason why the plaques get put at the stern, or at least I think they did, I think Bob Ballard started it, was because the front of the ship, like the bow, um, is like really romanticised. Obviously, the film helps. But it's really romanticised, and it's that shot of the front of the ship, and it, it looks almost kind of like normal. But then, the, and it's really romantic. But then you look at the stern of the ship, and that just looks like a death you've never experienced like that is just ripped to pieces. It's like a war zone, and it's showing you, like, yeah, okay, there's that beautiful front of it, and we can explore it and look at how the ages have changed and the people who died and it's refilled. But then you go and look at the stern, and it's just ripped to pieces. And it's like, this is not something. I think that sometimes it gets lost a little bit in, yeah, how much people like talk about it, and and, and that, and not that I'm criticizing at all, but I think you know, I mean, I saw online the other day. So you can buy like an inflatable, like you know, like a lie door that goes in your pool, and it's like, it's like the shape it's of the, shaped like that the wood arch, paneling. yeah. And you're like, that yeah. is, it's like, it's like, yeah, okay, it's quite funny, but on the other hand, you're thinking, is that appropriate? Like, I mean, I know it's from uh, the film, but you think I was gonna say that's from the film, <laughs> so I give it a little bit more yeah, leeway. Yeah, but if it was, uh, oh, I come down on a weird side of the stuff because so, so do I. I'm a little yeah. 
I mean, I interviewed somebody who the guy who made the passenger hitting propeller toy, and he was a delight. So I obviously. Well, does have... that actually exist? I thought that was just a joke. I mean, I've it kind of is, but it's a thing that like it's a parody. It's parody merch. You can buy one. I bought one for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's her thought... favorite. I did. It's her favorite part of the movie. I I've never been more delighted to give a present to a person. Like I was in town for one day, but <laughs> from visiting a family, and she was so busy. I was like, "Do you have time to come by my house?" She says, "I have ten minutes." I'm like. I don't care how few minutes you have. You have to come yeah. here. And I gave her this box and she almost dropped it. But um, <laughs> it's that kind of thing where I know some people are like, that's super inappropriate. And I, I, I understand that argument completely. I am not here to argue with anyone on that. But I think the, the bow, nope, the stern thing comes. Um, I talked to David Concanon, who's one of the guys who has dove down with Ocean Gate many times. And he talked about the stern and one of the things that he said that i i think lends a lot of credence for why the stern is so important is because that is where hundreds of thousands like hundreds of thousands of people experienced their last moments it was the stern it was there where they had their last chance for anything that was where people who were clinging to any hope of the ship floating were left and he says that when you dive to Titanic, firstly, he says that it takes a lot more from you than it will ever give back, mm -hmm. which to me makes a lot of sense. And secondly, he says, when you take that submersible around the stern, that even people who are like skepticals or non or non-believers and stuff, even they can feel the gravitas of that location because it's true. 1500 people died and many of them did so near or on the stern of the ship kind of makes sense that there would be a lot hanging on to that very literal ghosts of the abyss would just yeah. be hanging out there because that's where a lot of people were i mean we saw it in the movie that's where jack and rose were at the last second of the ship they were at the very back and you saw how many people were holding on to the railing because it's all they had left yeah it's a yeah it's, it's a it's a very sobering thought i mean what because yeah. Because I mean, there, there was even testimony from from a few survivors, and then mm -hmm. that thought that when the ship broke in two, that it might float. Mm -hmm. There was an idea that it might float, and then obviously it didn't. Yeah. It just tipped over and went. Um, but it's yeah. I mean, what would you? But then, but then there's other other people who who described the stern thing. I think the film definitely, and I think James Cameron's admitted this. I think the, the film definitely over exaggerates how high it went in the water and, and it didn't yeah. it didn't sit up like a top and I think it overdoes how much suction there was and how much explosive there was. But then, then on little, the other yeah. hand, because I, I think that the guy who's next to to put it in the perspective of the film, for the people who've seen it, the 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 guy who Rose looks at, who's dressed all in white next to them, that's based on Charles uh, Charles, yeah. Um the baker and he said it it, it felt mm -hmm. like he was riding down in an elevator and he stepped mm -hmm. off and said he never even got his hair wet. So yep. this is it's, it's he was very, also very incredibly different. drunk at the time, which good for him. Well, it's funny because they, they they reckon like scientists reckon that 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 being drunk inebriated it actually yeah. it, it makes you die of hypothermia quicker. So that's what they they think. I don't know it's something about your capillaries and stuff. I don't really understand it. I have um, no idea. I think it's I think drinking makes your capillaries smaller, which means the blood doesn't flow as well, and you get colder quicker. I think I'm not I'm sure. I'm remembering a bit from um, Family Guy where Stewie is lecturing Brian. He's like, you know, alcohol doesn't actually make you warmer; it constricts the blood vessels, then he gets told to shut up. So I think you're right. I just don't. I, I didn't get the full explanation because Brian told Stewie to shut up. Yeah, got my money. Where's my money? I, love, I used to love that. I used to love that. <laughs> I did used to. Like, it's not funny anymore. Well, it, it did a be. Simpsons. It went on too long, didn't it? It just went on. It just went on too long. It's still going it, on. It, it, but no, you can uh, you can tell in the in the Ghost of the Abyss how kind of nervous Bill is that he's like he's mm -hmm. like he's like oh maybe twelve and a half thousand feet down maybe this is more adventure than I wanted, um, which it's I thought was fun. yeah. If the idea is scary. I don't. I'm, in a hypothetical world, sometimes I think it's like, would I like to dive to Titanic? It's like, yeah, yes. But on the other hand, if I actually got onto the Caldish and they were like, all right, time to climb into the submersible, I might be like, I think I forgot a thing in my stateroom. Yeah. That's going to take me seven and a half hours to retrieve. Yeah. So you guys just may as well go ahead without me. Let me know how it goes. 
Like it, it might turn into very that just yeah. because it's just that that's so, it takes two and a half hours to dive down there, man. Like, can you imagine how far down it is when you have to spend two hours sitting in a fuselage made out of metal and glass and other people's engineering? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I think then again, though, I mean, it's you put you put your lives in somebody else's hands when you go on a plane. So I suppose if you put it, if, if well, I, I try, it. if I try, well, if I tried to put it in that perspective for myself, if I, but I don't know if I would, I think somebody asked me this. One of my friends said, would, if you ever got the chance, because mm. you, uh, unless you're like a billionaire, you're not going to get the chance. But yeah, it's $250,000 oh, for a citizen passenger. Currently. It's a lot of money, by the way. Yeah, it's... that's probably got to be like two hundred thousand pounds or something. Yeah, the pound's not doing great against the dollar. It, it, it doesn't matter either way. It's still it's, a lot yeah, of freaking it's, oh, money. Yeah, it's like two hundred. Yeah, it's like two hundred. Yeah, it's thousand astronomical. Pounds. That's it's light. And it, it, somebody asked me the same thing too. Just like, well, if somebody gave you two hundred fifty thousand dollars, would you go? It's like, the answer should be quote unquote yes. But I'm thinking like, dude, I live in a basement apartment. No, I use it to not live in a basement apartment anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, yeah. as much as it would be amazing to do that, it's like, okay, yeah. So I go on this expedition to Titanic and I come home to a basement apartment again and like have to live my life. Great. At least you get used to the small. I mean, after, after, ah! the, after, the, after the That's true. It would feel luxurious the after, after the Caldas. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, th- I think if, I mean, oh yeah, I'd take the money all day and run. But if mm. somebody said like, here's a free, t- here's my ticket. You can't refund yeah, that's it. That's different. You can't change it. Here, you get yes. to go. Exactly. Then, like then the ticket's me, already purchased. If yeah. you don't take it, no one goes down. It'd be like, you're forcing my hand, man. But I guess oh, I'll go. Yeah. I mean, go on then. But I suppose right. <laughs> part, part of me would probably like the 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 kiddie part of me would be like, oh my god, yes. And then the the, the other part of me would like, do you really want to go and see this? Do you really want to go and see the the the, the twisted like remains of a ship like that? I don't know whether. Yeah, that's it. I I don't I don't know, but it's the same. It's the it's the same kind of feeling I get towards because I know they've not they're building that like that replica in China, aren't they? That I know it's not going to float. But people have said, "Oh, would you go and see that?" And I've gone, "Well, no, because it's not the real thing. It, 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 it doesn't. It wouldn't mean it. I mean, would it be na- nice to see? Maybe, but I'm the kind of person who'd probably overthink it and be like, "Well, I don't like it and find it a bit distasteful because it's been done for tourism." So I think that the only, not only, but like the best way to do some sort of replica, whatever, whatever, would be to do a dry dock version of Titanic as a museum. Because that way, it's not floating anywhere. It's not going anywhere. Because honestly, I don't think you could get people today to share actual, like, replica third-class cabins. Like, for strangers, people wouldn't go for that shit. The fact that there was, like, not enough bathrooms and stuff. But if you make it completely historically accurate and make it a museum, then people just walk through and tour it. It's cool, etc. It's a little respectful, whatever, whatever. But I feel like making a weird pseudo-replica to float <laughs> yeah, I mean to be fair, they probably would. I mean, oh god, this is going to be so boring, but this is just me in a nutshell. I think <laughs> the, uh, the <laughs> I think if they tried to do that, the health and safety probably wouldn't let them because yeah, if it was a full replica, the there wouldn't be enough like fire escapes and stuff like it wouldn't be because you know you've oh, like they say it when they made the film, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Um, about about basically, like yeah, it's okay to like you get they were getting lost in the set and that was just the oh, set. Yeah. It's just so, a, that thing was a minefield. It's it is bananas. There are so many bananas things about this entire disaster, and I want to go. I don't know if I'm skipping ahead or not because in the documentary itself, because I do want to talk about this lifeboat segment. Okay. Because first of all, it took up like 30 minutes, and second of all, because in the movie again, like we were talking about, you kind of not gloss over, but you kind of got to get over some of the logistical stuff. Just watching exactly how physically intensive it must have been to load, like properly rig up a lifeboat in order to, you know, get the davits out, get the lifeboat situated, swing it out, lower it to deck level, convince these idiot people to get into it without absolutely losing your sanity. Because let me tell you, that would be the step in the process where I fucking failed. It would be like, ma'am, you and your hat better get in that boat. I am not messing with this. 
it's just like i wouldn't have the patience then you got to get them in there and then once it's full of people you gotta crank that down by hand you and a buddy while everyone's losing their minds you got to do it at the same time and then once you're down there you got to loosen that boat try to do it again yeah i mean part of the part of the thing of uh, the the irony is they had an electric winch which which you can see on the deck now they they, they Mm -hmm. could bring the boats up really quickly because the idea was it would be a ferry between a boat and a rescue boat exactly um but that's part of the problem they they couldn't get people into it because there was Mm -hmm. the seemingly was nothing wrong uh although they didn't they didn't launch a lifeboat for an hour but there you go um it was just it was just a uh, this is something they don't talk about as well the fact that yeah People talk about how heroic the crew were. Yeah, they were. They did the best. But obviously, it's different because there was no like public announced systems. But they really fell to pieces. Like the films and documentaries that, well, not the doc- the films that have that scene where all the all, they all get around and go, the ship's going to sink. It didn't happen. Yeah. So it, it like gives this what false, also didn't false happen impression. Was- uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but like no, one of fine. the things that really kind of makes people super aware of things, like especially again in the Cameron film, was the iceberg hitting sequence is shown as super dramatic and reactive. Like it shows the people down below reacting like right away, yelling, close this, do that. Every Everyone is suddenly on high alert. Not just a couple people, but like every basically everyone crew related is like, okay, let's go. And it gives you the impression that everyone, or at least a majority of the people who needed to be, were instantly like in go, go, go mode. But if you read these like minute by minute books or the night to remember, or these recollections where they talk to um, like the surviving crew members, they're like, yeah, we didn't get orders to do stuff right away. Or people who were at the opposite end of the ship, like stewardesses and stewards who were at the opposite end of the ship, would have no way of knowing anything. So it wasn't this massive, urgent rush that the movies portray. It was very much not that. And it wasn't exactly sinking fast, so you couldn't tell. So yeah, they were basically like, hey, you know that tiny little bump you just felt? We're going to need you to get in this boat real quick about it. And people yeah. were like, how about no? Yeah. Yeah, it was, I think, yeah, I mean, I think this part, it definitely the chandelier and first class movement and stuff like that is kind of a little, a little, well, it is over the top. It makes sense for someone like Thomas Anders to have noticed because he being the designer of the ship, it would be like, well, that's not normal. You know, it's like that one I was willing to kind of pass over because, you know, someone like that would notice. But if that had been, say, just like a random first class woman noticing the shaking of the chandelier, it would have been like, absolutely not. Yeah, that is well, not your concern at all. <laughs> yeah, you have that in the film though, where that woman's like, um, she's like, oh, I see if I'm, so, I felt a shudder. Oh, that wasn't bad, you know. I was, yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> that was pretty good. That wasn't bad. I was gonna, excuse my accent's not like hers, but I was gonna, yeah, I'll see if I can drop it into the upper class English. Yeah, I wanna, um, I wanna see. Oh, this is gonna be better than mine. Because I've literally just, I was watching a bit of it earlier. It was, was why it? have the engine stopped? Oh, yeah. I felt a shudder. Steward, why have the engine stopped? I felt a shudder. Oh man, yeah. we've we've likely thrown a propeller blade. Exactly. That's the shudder you felt. Can I bring you anything? Yeah, I, like so life I, sport, quick. About this isn't about Ghost of the Abyss. This is about the movie. I like the movie Titanic, but James Cameron is not the best writer, and sometimes there are these weird exchanges of dialogue. And oh, yeah, that yeah. is one of them where it is like some high school play acting where it's like, and scene. Steward, excuse me. Why have the engine stopped? I felt a shudder. Oh, not to worry. Miss, you likely throwing a propeller blade. Can I get you anything? It's like, that what's went a bit, that happening? Went a bit, that went Australian. but I don't know good. what is happening, but it was still it like, Australian. why? It's decent, <laughs> that accent went from an all right English to just well, like a really... It was very over dramatic and just the intonation she used, like, why if the engine stopped? I felt a shut. It's very... Yeah. Oh, yeah, no it's, it's very sing-song, like yeah. Well, yeah. it's yeah, it's, it's just posh, isn't it? But what, what, the, the, the part that... Um, we, I, I did a review of one of James Cameron's films recently, and we did have the well, discussion. Avatar because that movie is terrible. Yes. Oh, it was. Yes. And we were talking about <laughs> how based we were. Yeah, it was with a guy who runs an Avatar podcast, also called Sean. Funny enough, but he he. We were talking about how James Cameron, like, we love his films. I don't love that one, but whatever. Uh, they're very on the nose. There's a there's like. Like, like, there's a scene in Avatar where the guys, the, the Giovanni Rabisi's like, man, they're just goddamn trees. And you're like, oh. <laughs> you're like, you just, not... you're just there like, oh. For... The, the, the thing with, you know, the, the it's just the, the dialogue, which is a little hokey <laughs> oh, at, yeah, at, it is, at yeah. times. But to it does go back to the concept that, like, not everyone knew what was going on. Like, even the some of the um, crew were, I mean, that guy probably was honest. He was probably like, eh, no big deal. Like, 
probably had a thing and he wants some tea or something. He's probably just thinking in his brain, like, if I get this woman back in her cabin, I can go to bed. Yeah. Well, there's that guy <laughs> who comes up to Thomas Andrews. He's like, care for a drink, sir? And he's like, there's, there's people getting loaded on boats. Outside. But but on the other hand of it, there were people who, <laughs> there was, um, oh, what was his name? I think it was William Taft. He was like, he was like a, an aide to the president of the United States. Um, um, Archibald Gracie was Taft's aide. Archibald, oh, yeah, sorry. But, Archibald, Archibald but Yes, there that's we what I'm thinking Thank you, yeah. There's um, too many Archies on that ship. Goddamn Archies. Uh, sorry, for that. that was a horrendous accent, wasn't it? Well, no, that, the, the whole thing about that is like, there's a bit where they, they literally, that scene which you see in all the films where they're all like, right, let's let's play another hand of poker. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that, there are accounts of people doing that because they knew, they knew, the, the men knew. Like, I think mm-hmm. probably one, one of the best quotes of Guggenheim outside of, uh, could bring me, you know, uh, the famous probably one. Probably would like a brandy. Well, yeah, I love that little ad. That's just James Cameron's. That was, but I think that the best quote of his was like, "No, no woman on this ship will, no woman or child on this ship will die because I was a coward," which yeah. I th- or something along those lines. Which I think perfectly mm-hmm. juxtaposes to Ismay, who jumped off. Uh, well, it, well, he stepped it in the boat and off he goes. But ah, it's goes. it's complicated too because the other thing is again when people didn't think that the ship was sinking, yeah. you had these crew members who had these lifeboats out on the port and starboard yeah. sides, like. Hello. Yeah. Come on. We hello and on Light Toller's side, he was pretty adamant about women and children only, which we, you can get into a debate as to whether he was right or wrong about that all day long. But Murdoch was women and children first. So especially in these early boats when you know men were probably accompanying their wives and children, first class men accompanying yeah. their little families up to the docks. After they got everyone on board, they were probably like there's seven people in this boat right now yeah, and 12, there is was 12 chi- yeah 12 or whatever 12. the case may be you know they were he was letting men on because he's like there is no one else here yeah. you are here that boat's kind of empty you should get in that boat so i can get rid of this boat and get more people into the next boat so like i don't fault dudes who were who like legitimate if as long as you didn't shove someone out of your way for a spot especially in the early yeah. ones it's like yeah. dude save yourself i get it well I, I mean, it was, I, the, I the, the, it was the later ones that got bad because i think there was it's also like different. there was also a an aborted that well it's it, not aborted but it just never got passed along because the, the, there was like 900 yeah. crew um mm-hmm. the 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 idea was they would load the boats in the boat deck and then they would get down to the, uh, the promenade, the promenade deck, deck and they would open the glass window because they were glass I know you can't see them in photos they'd open the glass and they would mm-hmm. then let people in from there and it happened on a couple of the boats yeah. uh, for example JJ Astor's uh, wife Madeline she gets Madeline. in there and he throws her his gloves mm-hmm. and I think uh, and he she gets in there there was an idea that that's what they would do they would lower them and they'd let more people in there that's why a lot of them left the top deck for various reasons an interesting Madeline Astor tangential connection um, I went to a Titanic convention over the weekend. Um, I don't know when this is going to air, but the curator of the Pigeon Forge Museum in, um, in Tennessee um, gave a talk. And one of the artifacts he brought to, for us to look at was Madeline Astor's life belt. Um, so that was really cool to see. I got to touch it. That was absolutely incredible. But I think what surprised me the most is how hard it was. It's made out of cork yeah. and canvas. That must have been uncomfortable to sit in for hours. But um, yeah, all these people were getting in. I think the, the plan was to get them off the promenade deck, but eventually the the list of the ship, even though it wasn't super extreme, it's like when you're trying to load a lifeboat, though, a couple of degrees can really matter because yeah. they started having that big gap between um, the deck and the boats. And, you know, one or two inches you can kind of step over once the gap starts getting kind of big you don't want people leaping yeah it's just not gonna go well well especially in some of the dresses that they wore back then i mean there was i was reading in the book there was a lady who had to be helped in by seven men because she was wearing a dress that essentially finishes at your ankles and you can yeah is it called like a hobble dress or hobble skirt thank you thank you yeah that you can't walk you can't walk in them so they have to essentially help her in i can imagine uh, them launching her like a pencil okay you know you'd have to i mean it was What's that uh, Scottish game? What is the game from the Scottish Highlands where you kind of like launch a log? Toss the, that's kind of toss the cable. That's kind of how I picture it happening with her. Probably. I mean, if, I mean if, yeah. And then all these people were wearing like f- women were wearing heels and yeah. furs. You know, things that are great for running at speed. <laughs> I mean, it's funny you mentioned about the life the life jacket. Um, I saw one. I, I think it was a real one. I'm not sure whose it was. Uh, in the 
the uh, Maritime Museum in Liverpool, which is was obviously on the back of the ship because that's where it was registered. Um, mm-hmm. And what amazed me was how small it was. And I also saw yes. one of the like beds from the Olympic. And I saw it in real life. And it's funny because when you see things They're from little. the ship in real life, uh, like the Olympic in real life, God, it's like so gaudy. It's, it's so like so small. Yeah, it's small. And like the, the, the bed that was like the same kind of uh-huh. wood that made a lot of the ship, it was like, oh, that's really gaudy. That's really like you see like crazy gaudy. Like there's um there's a few replica um areas. One of the replicas that they have is like one of the parlor suite rooms, sitting rooms in this museum. And it is just Gilded. brown and gold and velvet yeah. and whatever and more and more and flowers and vases made of gold and it's just like oh my god yeah yeah it's like you gil- almost can't breathe yeah well like gilded age yeah it's, it's uh well it's everything clean. is gilded yeah pretty much excuse Oof. me yeah pretty much i mean just, yeah um i was just trying to think about it. oh yeah i love to <laughs> drag drag myself back to the film I love the shot of um, the Russian pilot just having a nap. And then you see, like, Bill Paxton's just, like, just staring at the roof as if he's just going to start, like, crushing in. And it was... I love, like, the difference between what he's like in the film, obviously he's acting, to what he's like in real life. It's just totally different. Yeah, it, 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 and it, again, it's this great audience proxy because it's like, I would also be super concerned if my pilot were sleeping. Yeah. Even again, like, I'm sure, as you've mentioned, this guy probably knows what he's doing. He's probably got an alarm, a timer, got it down to his science, but like, I don't know that. I'm an idiot trapped in this bubble <laughs> with you, and um, <laughs> I might start freaking out <laughs> at any second. You don't know. I'm almost more worried for the pilot if it were me in there. I'd be like, listen, I'm more worried for your safety because I might start freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> you don't yeah. know. Oh, that bit where he needs to go to the toilet. He's like, I need to, I need to go to the toilet. Like, yeah. can you turn around? Um, but I, I tell you what I loved though. I loved, um, no, I'd like to see what you thought about this. I loved mm-hmm. the debates they were having between them all. Like I would have watched mm-hmm. a documentary just of them debating things because you could see it would be like having a bunch of people like us, deb- Titanic enthusiasts debating something. Because you're yeah. always going to get people saying, "Well, no, that didn't happen because of this. No, but isn't that because of that?" And I, I don't watch the documentary just about that. Like, I enjoyed those parts. I do too. Um, especially when things are obviously able to be kept civil. You, you know, there's sometimes places or things where people start to absolutely lose their minds, and you're like, oh, "Okay, we need to reel that shit back <laughs> in." But I, I, I think that one thing that is interesting about, like you said, like the Titanic community and its enthusiasts is that it does, in many cases, open up the ability to have a discussion about certain things. Like, and there's, um, there's a lot of instances in the community where there are split opinions. Like, I know that I have a very differing opinion about artifacts and bringing them back up than a lot of people do. Yeah. And I'm fine to have that discussion. Also, I'm not a giant James Cameron fan, so I'm also fine to have that discussion. I like Titanic, but like, where do I think, like, how do I think about him as a person? I've seen his other movies. Avatar sucked. I saw Terminator. They were entertaining. And it's just like, eh, all right, I'm done. But, you know, having those debates and discussions where you're able to keep the conversation alive to me is is what's important because as again like i said as long as you're able to keep it civil and or like moral then you know it's those discussions whether you're agreeing with people or not that help preserve the legacy which at the end of the day i feel is the most important that's the boil down of all of these movies and books and documentaries is that 1500 people died on this ship and we need to remember that they existed and that they were real and when you have these discussions and you have these conversations that kind of keeps that conversation going it keeps that name be bobbing around yeah i um i, I love the part i'm just looking at the last few bits of my notes i love the part where bill's like oh it's like the dark side of the moon when he sees like the yeah. the floor of the ocean i'm like you'd know bill apollo 13 you've been in this situation before <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss him. oh yeah he was he's great he was great um, and he's right though it's again it's just so dark like you can't even you can't tell from the photos and stuff but it just like i oh, how dark must it be down there Ugh. just i don't know like where you can't even see your hand in front of your face that kind of dark that kind of i don't like uh, it yeah i'm, I'm a, very disorientated um uh, funny part of the this thing as well, Bill Paxton was actually warned by a Russian crew member called Lydia, who issued the blue diving suits that they all wear before the dives, uh-huh. not to whistle on the ship because according to like old mariner superstitions, whistling on a ship summons the wind. So there's a bit of a 
trivia for you. I didn't know. I knew that whistling in a theater was bad luck. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to whistle on a ship. I feel mm. like you see things about sailors whistling. Is that is that just wrong? I, I think it's one of those things. It's one of the things. It's like saying a certain Scottish play in a theater. You're not supposed to do it because it's bad luck. <laughs> That's true. I didn't know that though. Like I, I mm, interesting. That's what. Well, I guess it make... kind of makes sense because all those distress signals and all the. The, the mariners' calls are done via whistles, so I guess back in yeah. the day it would have been like, that's super official sounding stuff. Don't do that. You'll confuse the crew. Yeah, maybe. Maybe? maybe? I don't know. <laughs> well, you, yeah, you, you, get that, uh, you get that sound on Star Trek when they call the captain. <whistles> yeah, kind of, I was going to say, like, yeah. I, even I know that, or I don't know. You just, I think I've seen like Disney films where they have pirates and stuff. Someone's usually freaking whistling on the deck. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. using a Disney film for historical reference, so that tells you everything you need to know about me. Well, it's, it's not a bad idea. There's some That's good. True. There's some good documentaries on Disney Plus. But yeah, well, I think Disney originally made. It's not on Disney Plus, weirdly enough. But Disney, I think, originally made Ghost of the Abyss, or was part of the production team. Huh? Like. Yeah, I don't remember, but yeah, it's not available on Disney Plus, so well, they can't Walden, own Walden, it. Walden Media were, because they're in the back of the book, so uh -huh. I don't know if they were connected to Disney. But uh, I know um, there's a few documentaries on there that are made or produced or something by Disney. Super weird. I have no idea. The part about Mrs. Elizabeth Lyons, so she's the woman that we see in the Titanic film and in this. Who said that she heard Ismay say to Captain Smith, "Can you get the boilers lit? Get us going, basically." I thought that was the Countess of Rots. Miss mm, Elizabeth Lyons, apparently. Oh, is that what they did in the film? Mm, uh, oh no, she walks it's... past it because it's in the film after. It's in the film when is, the Countess of Rots because she's like, a, I think that "Oh, there comes that fellow, the brown woman." It's that bit, mm -hmm. isn't it? That but I think originally, brown. at least. Um... There may have been mis um um inaccurately accredited to her being the one who overheard the conversation. Ah, possibly. So, because I, I um, I but don't. Yeah, it was a real I, conversation overheard by a real person. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I agree with the fact that, and I'm not saying she didn't hear it, but I don't know if Smith, because the whole I I, I might I, I would agree with him saying it, but then the the whole thing about get us into New York on Tuesday night, for me. They knew the Titanic wasn't a quick ship. It was slow. It was luxurious. That was the whole point. It was an older design. It wasn't like the blue ribbon ships of like Mauritania, Lusitania. It wasn't going to break the record. It wasn't. So the idea right. that getting to New York on Tuesday night, which would completely inconvenient all the passengers because of the train schedules and people meeting you with a car and you know, obviously the rich. Yeah, they people. have their own plans set up. Yeah. So it doesn't make any sense. Like hotel bookings and getting into getting into the New York a day early or half a day early would not it doesn't make any sense and it would probably cause inconvenience so i'm not sure how much i actually i don't buy that as such but i mean that's what i like about Titanic. there's so much not that there's different sides to take but i like that there's so much wiggle room like i think people think that mm -hmm. everything's all been discovered and we know everything well we don't there's a lot we not don't know especially the last half an hour because once the lifeboats had gone the majority of people on the ship like 1500 died so there's 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 no real story after that if we yeah. could get the stories from those people you can't but if you ever could by some magical way then it, those stories would be unbelievable because they were on they would until the very end and there was there was hundreds of them I mean, the stories of third class passengers who just went back to bed because they knew it was kind of all over Nothing I mean, else to i've do. no doubt it was not just third class as well who did that i mean look at look at the owner of macy's uh, is it on eyes of strauss that i won't leave my husband i refuse we've lived together we'll die together and it's an interesting thing to think about. I, I I like discussing the different parts of it. There are so many different, you know, people on the ship. I mean, there's one story that I, I like. I, it's one of those things where it's like you can, but also can't verify it. You know, people say that it was a story of Anne Elizabeth Isham, who was a first class passenger who was said to have boarded with her great Dane. And when she was told that her dog would not be allowed to come into the lifeboat with her, she was like, well, guess I'm not going then. And, you know, they, you know, some of those things are, th it's like, they say later that the, you know, a corpse of a woman holding the corpse of a dog was found later. I mean, uh, I, th I think I've, I've read definitely the part about people being found clutching dogs because um, there's a story. I, th I, I, don't, I think it's corroborated. I, I, 
or if it's not, it's generally accepted um, that um, John J. Cabasta, he, he went and opened the kennels, which mm-hmm. was in the fourth funnel. Because the fourth funnel was d- a dummy. It was used for ventilation, uh, yep. and it was also used as like a kennel and storage because it was huge. Um, and, and a he climbing went and, way for people to yeah. get up and down if they needed to see something. Exactly. I mean, like four four dogs survived the sinking, which I always think is crazy mm-hmm. that people died and dogs survived, but that's just me. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and things like that. The fact that there were, there were dogs kind of running about. I, I think you see that, mm-hmm. but I don't know if you see it in the scene. film. Yeah. Um, so it's it's an interesting thing, but I think the it's funny about that story because the only first class passenger who died, she gave her she gave her position up in a lifeboat, and she's the only like first class woman who who, uh, mm-hmm. who died. So. Yeah, it's um the the whole men and women for uh, uh women and children first as well like that that if anything women and children only made it worse because the families had lost their breadwinner they'd lost the one who went out and worked so that's why after the sinking you get all these you know Titanic fund and Titanic orphan funds mm-hmm. and all this because the pe- the people had nobody uh, no it was, it was a wife and kids and it's like how, how are we going to get money you know, there was no benefits yeah. or welfare or anything like no, that. We didn't have FEMA setting up tents for them or anything, but also there were five first class women that did not survive the sinking. Oh, there you go. Got that wrong. See, this, this is why we. <laughs> uh, one of which was Anne Elizabeth Isham. <laughs> oh, okay. well, I never knew but that. I mean, still, one out of, I mean, five. Five is a really, really low casualty rate when you consider, yeah. you know, the other classes definitely did not have that survival rate. Yeah, although I think the worst, uh, I think first class men. I think died. It was second class on, men. Was it second class? Oh god, I'm for some reason it was a second class men that had the worst casualty rate. Right? I mean, besides like the crew, but yeah, out of the passengers. This is why I don't do statistics because I start to fall down. <laughs> see, <laughs> I don't know the exact numbers. I just happen to know some of them. Do I know who fared like third best? No, uh, I'm not sure. But uh, I, I have no clue. It, it didn't go well either, did it? For, for I think no, that's no. part of this documentary where they venture into the front of the ship and mm-hmm. they. They find like the cruise quarters and they find that that like medicine bottle that's like beautifully mm-hmm. like almost luminescently green, it, yeah. and it just stands out um, in amongst all this like mess and debris, darkness. Yeah, well, it's pretty. It's pretty rough. And the fact that there was like uh, Thomas Andrews designed like a water fountain to go there for the for the the stokers, the boilermen to actually use. Like, and that was mm-hmm. this is like that they didn't expect to find that and. The same with like the entrance gates. They didn't know they were there. They didn't, no one knew what they looked like, you know, because this was yeah. a new ship. And especially through reading it and watching the documentary, you find out that they actually found a lot of similarities to the Olympic, a lot more than they thought. Yeah, yeah. there was tweaks here and there with different columns and more columns to the Titanic, but on the whole, they were able to answer questions about the Olympic mm-hmm. through what they found the Titanic. So, but no, you're <laughs> right. They 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 were basically identical i mean sister ships is a bit a bit of an understatement as you said they did tweaks and especially after the sinking of the titanic they you know reinforced the hull they added more to the olympic but by and large in terms of especially things like aesthetics decor and layout check 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 yeah completely the same that they were meant to be that way it was an intentional design i mean that was what it was supposed to be it was supposed to be part of a set one of three yeah exactly (laughs) And it's only because of the Titanic disaster that the changes to the Britannic happen and they get more lifeboats and those massive cranes, mm-hmm. which makes them... And then the war breaks out, so the Britannic yep. becomes a hospital ship. And so, and then sinks in quicker time than the Titanic. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a mine off the coast of Kia. So, yeah, it's... it's uh, thankfully, thankfully, whilst it's on its journey there, not on its way back, because had it hit yeah. the mine on the way back, it would have been full of, like, 4,000 men all injured. And that, I mean probably would have been worse so i mean <laughs> what a nightmare small mercies eh? but um yeah were there any more things that you wanted to go over on the film because i think i've reached in my notes on the actual film just that i really want to try build building do you want to build a lifeboat no <laughs> i want to try lowering a lifeboat with a person i want to see i want to try it just i'm one of those people that's like can i try that mostly just like i betting it's freaking hard yeah. And, I mean, they make it look easy in the movie because these are, like, trained mariners who are just, like, breaking chains by punching in them and then just cranking these things like it's, like, they're winding their watches. I want to try it and see exactly how hard it is because I'm betting you I'd be super mad by the time I was done. Yeah. I mean, the well and damaged were state-of-the-art. They, they were mm-hmm. designed so that they could 
I mean, they show you this in the Abyss, uh, a film where they were designed yeah. to to go completely all to the way, swing in, completely just swing out and get another and lifeboat and bring it out. And that was the which idea. Which was revolutionary of... at the time. Yeah. And one of the things they show you in Ghost of the Abyss, which I really like, is that last set of Davids is still cranked yeah. out. To they were just so hopeful they'd get that lifeboat down. Yeah. Well, this is the um, that when they made the, the Titanic film, they reinforced they got the same company to build the the, the mm-hmm. Davids to the exact the design. Davids. But they said, "Oh, can you can you can you reinforce them?" Like they said to Welling, "Can you reinforce these?" And they did. But even they said even with reinforcing them, they, they were identical, but the reinforced because you know health and safety, not having film. Right, right, right. Um, they said even as they were putting the people in the boats, the the Davids were flexing. They could mm-hmm. see them flex. And that was reinforced. So they said, they thought maybe that was part of the reason that people were so reluctant to go in. They looked and thought, I'm not getting in that. Why would you leave a, a beautifully warm mm-hmm. ship with, you know, the brandy and the coffee and all that kind of, in the middle of the, that na- you've I mean, been the, told is, the night? That you've been told is unsinkable, can't sink, won't sink, yeah. can't stop, won't stop. And yeah. now they're like, hey, would you like to stand on a plank of wood? Exactly. No, um, I think I'm good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean that's that's the that's the that's the whole point. Um, so I think that's that's probably part of the reason why. And yeah. I, I think another thing that annoys me about well, not annoys me but that kind of makes you realise, you know, when you read things and that people say, oh well, if they'd have had no our lifeboats, people more people wouldn't be safe. And you go, no, would they? Because they would didn't they? get they had twenty lifeboats on board, mm-hmm. and they didn't even launch and all those. Two of them floated. I mean, two one floats away upside down, one floats out. Um, yeah. they didn't even have time to get. I mean, although they delayed an hour before they actually launched any of them, uh, yeah. but the, I mean, the, that's the thing with the crew. They in the film they look really efficient, and I've no doubt they did a good job getting the boats down. So you can't take anything like that away from them. But they'd never done a drill before. There was meant yeah. to be a lifeboat drill on the Sunday that Captain Smith cancelled for yeah. unknown reasons. But as for thinking the ship was, you know, unsinkable, Captain Smith was documented. He sat on one of the tables in the first co- with first class passengers and he mm-hmm. he said if Titanic was like this I don't know if he used bread or something or whether he just <laughs> described with his hands but he said if you could cut the Titanic lengthways into three bits and all the three parts would float that's the confidence that whether that was just hubris yeah. or a little bit of you know trying to make them at ease but I do think there was that kind of arrogance there uh, of well we've so. de- we've defeated nature you know we th- this exactly. th- nothing could sink could it was that it wasn't just the titanic it was everything of that era where it was like i think i think we got it yeah i think i think we've 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 dominated the we we you know they figured out flight pretty soon afterwards they're like we figured the shit out we've got it together we have the answers it's like you don't but congrats for thinking that and um good luck with your funeral well, exactly. I mean, I mean, you, you've only got to go two years past this to 1914 to see what happens to the world. Mm-hmm. So if that that kind of belief goes very, very quickly. And I think it was this, the turn of that century where they'd realised, actually, we haven't got all this figured out. And yeah, it's funny uh, thinking about Ghost of the Abyss because you see that in the documentary when they film it, mm-hmm. they were actually on a dive when September 11th attacks happened. And mm-hmm. they actually, they all said that it felt like the the dive was over that how in, you know how inconsequential this is and we're yeah. down here probing this ship that's been down in ninety years but people have died today but then they actually realised th- th- there's a bit in the book and I think it kind of touches on it in the film where they feel like the the start of a new century something comes along and kind of goes yeah you know you thought you had the whole you had everything figured out well something's going to happen that's really going to mm-hmm. rock the, the world essentially. Um, and change the way people people look at things. So yeah. it's it's quite poignant in that respect, um, especially as you can see they don't have a clue what's going on. Um, like they don't understand, and they all that scene where Bill Paxton tells them that's the first time that they they got radioed saying something's happened, but they didn't know what was going on. No. And obviously they're busy; they can't stop and have a conversation. They're like, yeah, yeah, you have limited yeah. time, limited yeah. resources. You don't have time to like shoot the shit. You have to get in, get out, and go. Definitely. Um, so that was that was quite quite poignant. The, the film, I mean, it's, in terms of document, I don't know if you can rate a documentary, but I, th- I, I think it's probably one of the better ones. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly in terms of seeing how difficult it is to explore rather than just showing you the ship. Yeah. No, I agree. You know, it, it, it gives that it, it gives you that insight into like here's how you actually lowered a lifeboat. Here's how hard it was. Here's how hard it was to get inside of the ship. 
this is how long it takes to get down here. Here's everything you need to do to prep to even get on the Keldish. It was very much like, oh, you don't just walk onto a ship. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure most people never thought that, but you know, it was it was just that insight that everything is a, is more than you think it is. I thought it was it was a good documentary, and I think it's probably one of the better ones out there for how I difficult agree. it is to explore. I do want to go back and um, look at. I think James Cameron did another one that was like Return to Titanic because that's on Disney so. Plus. So I want to give that. A, I almost watched it before this, but I, did, I didn't want my brain to get confused as to what I'd seen <laughs> in one, as to what I'd seen in the other because it doesn't take a lot. So uh, yeah, I mean, also not to say that they. They eventually all run together. Yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah. Well, after you've seen a few, um, they can kind of start to run together a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Uh, would you uh, like to tell everybody uh, who you are, uh, what your podcast are? Although you did at the beginning, but who you podcast? Would I like to talk about myself? Absolutely. Well, it's like the it's like the shameless plug of the episode. Oh, before we get to that, <laughs> would you like to tell everybody oh! what's on the mug? I absolutely would love to tell everyone what's on a mug. It is a red mug with very nice white lettering that says sugar tits. There you go. <laughs> it's from the uh, it's from the comedy Gavin and Stacey, uh, British comedy. That It's one of the nicknames for one of the characters. Awesome. So, so if you're in the UK, you should get one of those. Yeah, definitely. Definitely get one. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, so that, there's your little trivia. For, there's your little ending part. So hey. would you like to tell, like to tell everybody um, where, like, who you are, where you're from? Sure. Um, my name is Alexia. I live near Washington, D.C. in the United States, um, and I am the host of a podcast called Titanic Talk Line, where every episode I talk to a new person about Titanic. Some of them are very serious and academic, and some of them are um, about Muppets. So it, it, it's quite the spectrum of uh, listening, and uh, you can find it on all of the podcasting platforms or YouTube. It's just called Titanic Talk Line. And just to make everything easy, I'm on all the social medias as Titanic Talkline, all one word, and you can get in touch with me there. I'm actually looking for season two guests, so if anyone listening is a fan of the movie or the ship or the documentaries or has watched any of the other movies, uh, get in touch. We should have a conversation. Definitely. Obviously, you've spoken to L.A. Beadle. She's, she's, uh, she's great. That was a good episode. Um, she has a great podcast um, herself. It's called Unsinkable. If you're a Titanic fan, hers oh, is yeah. very much about Titanic and history and it's smart people stuff. Well, I also watch non-Titanic movies, so if <laughs> if you want to have somebody on to talk about something nonsensical, let me know. I'm usually up for that stuff, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a good idea. Um, if you've got like a fi- one of your, a film that you love that other people think is terrible, I have a movie that is it's what I call Hilara bad. One of my favorite <laughs> movies to like torture people with is Showgirls. Oh, okay, you can come do that then. I've got a yeah, sad. That's- I've got a, <laughs> no. I've got a side series. If anyone doesn't know that, Alexia might not. Uh, I've got a, like I've got a few side series. Honestly, I'm, I'm one of my friends said to me, "You're you're a whore. You'll go with anyone." But um, <laughs> it's legitimately what he said. I was, oh, thanks, mate. Cheers. You appreciate it a lot. Um, it, <laughs> um, it basically <laughs> that's what he said. That's the real one there. Yeah, that's a no. That's like in real life, friend. You know, that's how they talk to you. So oh, that's, um, that's the other quality when they just go straight for your for, oh right for, for the jugular yeah absolutely exactly um, it's like thank you it's seven thirty in the morning yeah I appreciate that thanks should we for your <laughs> podcast now um I see I've <laughs> talked um I was going to say my points you gone. have a side series because yes, I brought up showgirls it's called uh, defend <laughs> defending yourself it's just it so basically you come on and you defend your favorite bad film so far I've done Alien three. I did Meet Joe Black. <laughs> Meet Joe Black. I did A Night at the uh, Roxbury, which is the worst I've ever seen in my life. I did. Uh, uh, I did. Uh, She's I the man. I did. She's the man. I just listened to that one. <laughs> yeah, um, but I enjoyed that one. What else? Um, there's a few. There's a few that uh, that are that are there waiting to be edited down, um, and there's a few more that I've forgotten. Um, so yeah, go, go and let me know. And also in the very yeah. bad movies, I do hashtag Breaking Bill. Um, with Bill from Bill Reed's Bad Reviews, so I'm trying to basically just break his positivity, his, his Texan Floridian over Tell the top. It, you know what? Rope him in. We'll do a three-way uh, discussion of showgirls. That Good. won't all right, melt yeah. him I'll, down at all. I'll give him a shout, yeah. I'll give him a shout. Um, he'll Sweet. enjoy that one. I'm about, I'm just about to do a, a three-way um, like collaboration. But, hey, um, hey, this is a family, family audience. Don't talk about <laughs> three-ways like that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I brought him up, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Bill, Bill's married, so that's not happening. Um, I was going to say, hey, um, 
Oh, what was I going to say? Oh, God, that's thrown me completely. Um, <laughs> Bill, Bill on the turn off. Bill's very family friendly. He doesn't swear. He won't have listened to that. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, we're about to do Troy because that's just. That's, uh, uh, yeah. that's a bad I haven't thing. seen that, but I've heard nothing but bad things. Oh, it's. it's I mean, it's not good. Unless you want, unless I mean, unless you want to watch, I mean, Brad Pitt's in good shape, and that's what does it for you. Uh, <laughs> that's that's legitimately. Yeah, there's nothing else to watch it for. Not that that's what I watch it for, but it's just nothing to watch it for. Really, it's just it's poor. Valid points. I mean, I watch Showgirls because it's freaking hilarious. Just. <laughs> I've heard so of it, funny. but like I've heard of it, but I can't place it. I'm just gonna just before we. Oh, uh, it's it's it has the girl from Saved by the Bell in it, and she basically goes to Vegas trying to become uh, an exotic dancer with Gina Gershon. It's Paul Verhoeven. It's so bad. He directed Hollow Man. What's he doing directing Showgirls? I don't know. It's what on earth? bananas. Okay, blah blah. Oh, okay. Oh, I I know why I've heard of this. Because he he did Hollow Man. I think just after. One of the worst films ever made. Cool film. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. This is garbage. It's just... It's garbage that makes you laugh. I mean... And they're like, it's supposed to be a sexy movie. It's like, there's nothing in there that's sexy remotely, but congrats. Do you know what that's a bit like? It's a bit like Fifty Shades of Grey. That film. Yes, but this is worse. This is weirder. Worse? How could it be worse? It's weirder and campier. I don't know how, but it's worse somehow. Like... God. There's a there's a scene where a girl asks our main character where she's from, and she reacts completely normally by basically throwing a basket of fries and yelling, "Different places." <laughs> right. I mean, that's it is that's, a, yeah. That's so it's so, that kind of a movie. It sounds so gloriously American. I have to give it a go. It is. It is. Uh, <laughs> we, we, yes, we we should get in touch with your friend and figure out how to make this happen because I think this is a must. <laughs> I've just Sorry read a little bit about it. I don't uh, yeah, I don't know how the hell. I, I don't know if he, he'd want to talk about a film like that. He probably, probably won't. It'll just be like, man, I, I can't even. I can't. I just can't. It's, uh, we'll have to get I, somebody else to botch or us involved. Yeah, I've got an idea of who'd listen to that one. Sweet. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, thank thank you for uh, thank you for coming on. It's been a, it's been a great conversation. Um, I'm so going to have any... to have you come on mine. <laughs> oh, feel free. God knows what I'd talk about. Uh, Titanic, <laughs> probably. Um <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah so if anyone's listening you're listening to uh, Review It Yourself you can find us on Twitter it's at Yourself Review and we're also on Instagram it's Review It Yourself Podcast 2021 let us know if you want us to review any films um, if they're hey, bad hey if you're listening subscribe if you've been listening this long yeah. you owe him a subscription and a five star review yeah. get, so yourself do a, it. get yourself a sugar tits mug make a cup of tea <laughs> Sit down, and listen to the podcast. <laughs> oh, I'm the, okay. The best thing is, I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten because I, I literally, for the people who can't see, I've got, I've got a Del Boy mug, which is from a Only Fools and Arses, a, a big cup mm-hmm. of tea. I had tea in that one, and because I've been feeling a bit ropey, like my eyes are screaming, <laughs> allergies, honestly. Cold. I did myself a lemp sip. Uh, other uh, cold remedy drinks are available, and I, uh, <laughs> I'd made a lemon sip in that, and I was, and I like changed. I'd finished my tea, and I swapped over, and I, I'd forgotten what mug I'd used. So when you started laughing, I was like, "What have I done? What?" what <laughs> it was a very fun. It was surprise. just, it was just a mug. To be fair, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, um, no, thanks for coming on, and uh, if you've stuck Thank with us this me. long, it's it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. If you've stuck with us this long, uh, well done. And uh, go listen to some more because you've clearly you clearly like something in here. You deserve a cookie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening, everyone. Cheers. Mm-hmm.